Okay, I need to uh, bring you some breaking. So I'm sure many of you guys saw, but um, an entire like apartment complex, multiple apartment complexes were totally leveled. They, yeah, I'll pull up an article as well, but here you go news that we're getting in just in the last few seconds the israeli army uh, has officially announced that it has killed the uh, head of hezbollah uh, hassan nasrallah so that is the head of hezbollah hassan nasrallah has been killed uh, that is a confirmation by the israeli army they had uh, said that this had been uh, their target all along when they were um, bombing that Beirut neighborhood over the uh, over over the course of the night. Let's go st straight to Stephanie Decker. She's in Jordan's capital Amman because the Israeli government has banned Al Jazeera from reporting inside uh, Israel. So, uh, so Steph, I'm not sure if you have any more information than I do, but uh, yeah, this confirmation now coming from Israel's uh, military that uh, Hezbollah's chief Hassan Nasrallah has indeed been killed. I have the statement. I will just read some parts out uh, of it to you. As you mentioned, it says the army eliminated, this is their words, the leader, uh, Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah. Yesterday, the army killed the leader of the terrorist organization, the Israeli words, um, and one of its founders. The army also killed Ali Karaki, the commander of the southern front of the organization, and a number of other Hezbollah leaders. Um, it goes on to say, Air Force planes with precise intelligence guidance from the security establishment raided what they said at the time. Um so surely since they killed Hezbollah's leader, the bombing will stop now, right? That's why they killed all of those civilians, right? Hezbollah's central headquarters located underground, of course, in that densely populated area of Dahia, when those strikes hit 10 or 12 in quick succession, when we watched that unfold, there was no doubt that the target was a major one. Um, soon after, we had leaks from the Israelis uh, that Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, in charge of the group for 32 years, uh, had been there at the time. We still haven't had any official word we have to say from Hezbollah, but this just in from the Israeli army that they have managed to kill uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, um, Hassan Nasrallah. So, uh, Stephanie, this is something we've been uh, reporting throughout the morning uh, that uh, this leader, Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah leader, was the target of those uh, strikes on Beirut. Now, this confirmation from the Israeli military, you've just uh, confirmed with that statement there. Uh, I think at this point it's worth uh, talking a little bit about uh, who exactly he is. So, yeah, the leader of Lebanon's mili militant Shia Islam at Hezbollah movement. Uh, he's not been seen in public, has he, for years uh, because of fears of being assassinated. Uh, what more can you tell us about him and the significance of his, of his death uh, if it is indeed confirmed by Hezbollah? Hassan Nasrallah is a larger-than-life figure when it comes to the politics in the Middle East. He is the figurehead, uh, uh, Iran's linchpin, if you will. He really created Hezbollah into the organized, fighting, disciplined force that it is today. He came to power to the helm of the group 32 years ago when the former Secretary General was assassinated by Israel. And I think that is an interesting point also to show you that these groups don't just disappear with the assassination of senior figureheads. Of course, it is clear Hezbollah has undergone a... What? You mean if the state of Israel kills my entire family and everyone I know's family? To destroy the terrorist organization, terrorist organization too won't just appear. That's not true, even slightly. That's not true. Mm -mm. No. Who has the one fucking tweet? If Israel killed my entire family trying to destroy Hamas, I would make Hamas too. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> you can't murder hundreds or thousands of people and then say we did it we beat the terrorists massive hit 
when it comes to Israel's uh, war on them over the last couple uh, of weeks. But going back to Hassan Nasrallah, he is a man, I remember being in Beirut and covering the protests in 2019, when he spoke over speakerphones, because he hasn't appeared in public for years, as you say, Jude, Dude, what the fuck? I cut the head off the Hydra and then two more heads grew back. What the hell? to security concerns because, uh, you know, Israel wanting to assassinate him again is not new. But Lebanon would stop. Everybody listens to Hassan Nasrallah, whether you like him or not. And over the years, Hezbollah has in Lebanon uh, lost its support, if you will, of the people, especially when they started fighting in Syria. Many Lebanese thought this is no longer our fight. You are representing Iran. You are not representing us. There was also a lot of anger uh, among parts of the Lebanese society when Hezbollah entered um, in support of the Palestinians of Gaza on October the 8th. Many Lebanese friends I've been speaking to will tell you this is not our fight as much as they support the Palestinian cause because Lebanon has its own problems, because the Lebanese have lost all their money, because the Lebanese have their own struggles. It is and for people who haven't seen what the um, the footage looks like. The site where Hezbollah's leader was killed, uh, Hezbollah's longtime leader, Hassan Nasrallah, was killed Friday in an Israeli airstrike on his underground headquarters in Beirut. A significant escalation in the war. A series of loud explosions rang out and smoke rose from the city's southern suburbs. Images broadcast on local TV showed a huge crater where six buildings had been. As rescuers navigated the rubble, the strikes crushed. Uh, residential buildings that sunk beneath the ground, creating a large, leaving a crater bigger than the size of a soccer field. Footage of the level of damage indicated that Israel used 2,000 pound bombs. A weapons expert told CNN. Uh, and here you can see all these giant craters that exist. Uh, all of these were apartment buildings. See the apartment buildings over here? There were six of them right here that are completely gone now. This is the equivalent of using an RPG to kill the spider in your living room. How are people still justifying this? Oh man, wait till I show you guys what I found. Hugely significant, certainly. We cannot underestimate the turning point in the Middle East, in the geopolitical situation, when it comes to, um, you know, this assassination of Israel. Uh, it is a massive blow. We are going to have to wait and see what Iran is going to do. We're going to have to wait and see how it affects the internal situation. Don't worry, guys. Only one million people were displaced in Lebanon. Only one million. Situation in Lebanon. Uh, there is so much uh, to this, certainly. But, you know, just to recap, the Israeli military, not Hezbollah at the moment, the Israeli military confirming it has killed uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, along with various other senior members of the group. Excellent. Excellent. Surely they can build more homes that definitely won't get bombed again, right, guys? Right? Right? And surely there will be no negative consequences for killing all of those people, right? i bring you our other top story this hour. Israel has attacked the Yemeni port city of Hodeida. A wave of strikes hit an electricity plant and the Ras Issa seaport. The city is controlled by the Houthi group. It fired a missile towards Israel on Saturday and has pledged to continue its attacks until Israel's aggression on Lebanon and Gaza stops. I want to bring in Hassan Hossein al bukhaiti He's a journalist and political analyst. He joins us now. Also, just as a reminder, uh, they hit central Beirut, the city that used to be called uh, the shining jewel of the Middle East, that has been... Uh, bombed over and over again by Israel. That the ideas that we have about the Middle East, this is, I think, like... <laughs> I'm a little divorced from a lot of the um, Middle Eastern conflicts because my family or my parents did not leave uh, North Africa 
because of any particular conflict. They left because they wanted to and they wanted to immigrate elsewhere. Um, but I know probably almost all of the Arab people that I know and all of the Middle Eastern or Meta people that I know are in the U.S. or in Europe because they were seeking asylum or because their parents were seeking asylum or leaving an active war zone. I will say, though, I will never forgive Western powers for destroying the image of what um, Arab culture and Middle Eastern culture should be and could have been if not for extremist violence rising up due to instability in these nations that was propped up by Western powers. The fact that people think Middle East and then they think terrorist before they think of like the romanticized version of like the Middle East, like very Dune-esque is, uh, I will, I will never forgive. Now from Sana'a, first of all, can you tell us uh, about the attack thing in the two on months. Hodeida? Where Sword specifically uh, have the uh, Israelis been focusing uh, their attacks today in Yemen? Uh, it's been reported that uh, Israeli... Real Bad Arabs is a great documentary on the vilification of Arabs in the media. Well, I'm going to put it on the list for when we do the um, documentary subathon. He has conducted more than 15 airstrikes. They have targeted uh, Hodeida main, main port and as well uh, Ras Isa port. Uh, Ras Isa port is one of the main uh, oil port uh, of Yemen. Uh, that port is where Yemeni receiving uh, their fuel uh, from outside. And as well, they have targeted one of the most, uh, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, power station in Yemen, which is Al Khatib uh, power station, and as well Al Hali uh, power station in Hodeida as well. And firefighters now are uh, trying uh, to put fire uh, to put the fire out in those two uh, power stations. And there are reports of uh, uh, one dead and uh, several uh, casualty in those uh, latest attack uh, against uh, Yemen in Hodeida. Hossein, help us understand the significance of Hodeida. This is, a, this is really a key entry point for humanitarian aid to a country that has been suffering from mal malnutrition, starvation. The United Nations has warned of famine in several areas. What does it mean for, for Hodeida to be bombed? I believe this is the main goal of the Israeli regime is to put uh, a pressure on uh, the Yemeni people. Uh, Hodeida port, as you say, is one of the most uh, uh, economic uh, or economic city uh, for Yemen. And to target that port, it means that Israeli uh, want or trying uh, to close it and as well targeting those power stations. Uh, uh, this means it will affect only uh, the Yemeni uh, civilians because Israeli, they know that they cannot actually uh, target a military uh, installation or actually stop uh, or prevent in Yemeni from targeting Israel because they know that Saudi, for example, they have conducted more than 250,000 uh, air strike. They couldn't stop uh, the Yemeni army and as well uh, hundreds of attack by the United States and the UK in the last uh, uh, several months. They could not stop. That's why I believe they will continue uh, targeting uh, civilian uh, infrastructure that affect actually uh, all Yemenis. Uh, but as well, I want to mention that Mohammed Abdul Salam, the spokesperson of uh, uh, Ansar Allah, uh, also known the Houthi, he said that those attack actually will not uh, stop or prevent uh, or obstruct uh, Yemeni from uh, attacking uh, uh, the Zionist state of Israel or from uh, uh, keeping uh, or continuing to support the, uh, the people of Lebanon and as well the people of Palestine. And so tell us what the Houthis might do next. Uh, I think uh, or I believe that uh, it could be one of now the main uh, target uh, for uh, Yemeni army is to target uh, Israeli uh, port and as well to target uh, uh, Israeli uh, offshore uh, gas uh, platform because if they do so this means it will actually affect and damage uh, the Israeli uh, regime and as they targeted uh, Yemeni oil infrastructure I believe that this attack uh, could target as they say those uh, gas uh, platforms and I believe uh, that could be in the coming hour that Yemeni will extend uh, their attack against Israel and it will not 
uh, I don't believe that will be only with one missile or one drone. I think they will launch uh, several of those missiles and drones at once uh, because uh, they, they, they actually uh, want to support the Palestinian people. And, and so well, they tell want me, to stop tell the me, Hussein, Hussein, do you think and, they and, uh, will, do you think leaders? the Houthis will also focus yeah, okay. on sort of strategic s shipping lanes? Uh, I mean, for the shipping lane, uh, Yemeni army actually has successfully uh, blocked uh, the, uh, the, the Red Sea in front of any Israeli-linked ship or uh, ships that go going toward Israel. And as well have formed a blockade against any company or shipping company that is dealing with, uh, with, with, uh, with Israel. As we uh, remember that uh, in uh, the last attack, they have targeted an oil tanker uh, that belonged to uh, a Greek uh, uh, shipping company. That attack actually was because uh, that uh, shipping company, uh, one of their ship uh, has uh, head to one of the Israeli regime port. Uh, and I think that Yemen could actually extend uh, th their attack not only uh, against those shipping company, it could actually form a blockade against country that is actually dealing uh, with Israel, like the United Arab Emirates. Uh, really quick. I wanted to re reply and read some chat messages. I remember when I watched news as a kid, I got scared of the Middle East because uh, news said one leader there was there was threatening to bomb us. So news kind of makes th things way worse. I mean, it's by design, right? Like manufactured consent is real. <laughs> and if they can convince people that like the brown people are going to bomb you, so we need to bomb them first. I mean... The number, the sheer number of people that were excited to go kill brown people in the Middle East after 9-11 was crazy. Like insane. Like it, it's still crazy. Um, the even more bizarre thing is like we have so many pieces of media where an oppressor, uh, an oppressive state that controls resources, that uh, controls like all of the wealth in a region that controls the rights of the people that live in that region is the enemy and people rise up and they are the show frames the the uprisings as based that there is no right time to rise up against an oppressor and any attempt to try and convince people that there is a right time to do that is total nonsense right i mean uh what is the most popular example I would say is like Star Wars. And like the the what they're called like the rebellion or whatever. But most recently watching the first I've watched like the first two episodes of The Expanse. I mean, it's the same concept there as well from what I can see. It's just <laughs> it's just like, oh, here are the people being oppressed who are being exploited who have no rights here here they are trying to rise up and here are the oppressors saying how dare you use violence hey you can't do that only we can use violence to oppress you <laughs> and you're like wait a minute <laughs> this is insane <laughs> that's crazy that you're saying that this is insane and it's the same thing but as soon as it happens in real life as soon as a people uh I'm specifically here going to talk about the people living uh, in Gaza. As soon as a militant group rises up in Gaza, which we're not even going to talk about how Hamas rose to power, because it's a whole fucking conversation. The TLDR is that, surprise, surprise, Western powers benefit from religious militant groups being in power. But a people that have been oppressed, that have attempted many peaceful escapes from uh, um, their oppressors. Uh, I can't believe that there are people that are pro-Israel that have no idea about the uh, peaceful marches in 2014. Uh, the Great March of Return. Let me see if I can find... Um, Uh, I'll have to I'll have to look for it a little bit longer. I believe it's 2014, but I might be mistaken. It might be after that. I think it was 2014. No, 2018. Excuse me. 2018. 
where it was a demonstration, a peaceful demonstration by the Palestinian people living in Gaza, attempting to leave this open-air prison. And what did Israelis do? The IDF, Israeli snipers, were sniping children. <laughs> not armed. Not armed children. Peaceful demonstration. And these people are being murdered. Like, it's just... Like, <laughs> for people that have never seen it, Gaza Fights for Freedom will completely fuck your brain. Yeah, we've watched it before, but uh, actually, one's if you guys have seen it, two's if you haven't seen it. Um, it's the, I believe it's the documentary by Abby Martin. Um, and it's really good. It's really good. It, it's, it's, it has a very good breakdown of, like, how long this struggle has been going and how the struggle has not been inherently violent in nature on the Palestinian side. Um but I can put it on the list also because it's a really good one and I I highly recommend everyone watches it. Um, also, were they actually even trying to leave? I thought they were just marching to the fence. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you're right. They were not attempting to leave because the gates are closed. But the march of return is an attempt to leave Gaza to return to their homes. So, yeah. Better wording could be used there. Um, but it... To, to summarize the point, unsurprisingly, if you put a bunch of people in an open air prison for decades and they try all of the peaceful options that they can, a militant party will rise to power and attempt to dismantle the structure that is oppressing them and all of their friends and family. I know, very crazy, very shocking. And if this was fiction... <laughs> 100% of Americans would be like, this is so cool and so base, and I love these guys so much. And it's like, you're crazy. You're so insane. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh my god. Oh, Jesus Christ. Also, I have to... I, I'm gonna show you guys something cringe, okay? So please... <sighs> buckle in all right because it's it's like not good it's not good what i'm about to show <laughs> it's it's really not good i'm gonna show two things that are really not good one is this tweet which i'm assuming it's like 50 50 a total like dumb fuck or a psyop but it's the meme of like the guy standing up and it says israel wiping out hezbollah in one month with five generation warfare and assassinating their entire chain of command is undeniably badass and should be applauded 12,000 likes. And this person responds saying, attacking a civilian city full of families and ordinary people is actually not badass. It's quite evil. I love this response. Incredible. It's 100% badass. Every war in human history features atrocities that can be called evil by women? He was like, no, 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 no. It's not enough to be racist. I have to be sexist too, really quickly. <laughs> there is nothing unique about Israel's conduct against Hezbollah aside from how wildly effective it was. How wildly effective, huh? Is that right? then surely the conflict will end. Oh, I'm getting word here that a uh, Hezbollah deputy delivers defiant message following the killing of Nasrallah. Oh, just, they assert that despite the killing of the leader, Hezbollah remains militarily capable and ready to meet any Israeli ground offensive? What's that? Their deputy chief has pledged that the Lebanese armed group is ready to meet an Israeli ground offensive despite the killing of its leader and many senior commanders. Israel has not hit Hezbollah's military capabilities, <laughs> said Sheikh uh, Naim Qasim on Monday as he delivered a message of defiance in a public address. Despite the setbacks suffered during the bombardment of Lebanon in recent days, he insisted that the Iran-linked armed group will continue to fight. Hezbollah's operations have continued at the same pace and more since the killing of the leader Hassan Nasrallah on Friday. Wait. The operations have continued even more so after they killed their leader? That can't be right. Uh, Twitter user 
AJ Cortez just told me that it was wildly effective. And that only a woman would think that it was not wildly effective. Hey, wait a minute. Hey. He added that Hezbollah will just install a new leadership soon via internal mechanisms. The choice of a new leadership is clear. We are quite ready if the Israelis want a ground incursion. The resistance forces are ready for that. Hezbollah will continue with its main goals, despite Israel's aim of creating chaos with aggression and ma uh, massacres against civilians in Lebanon. Kasim continued. Israel is committing massacres in all areas of Lebanon until there is no house left without traces of Israeli aggression in it. Israel attacks civilians, ambulances, children, and the elderly. It does not fight fighters, but rather commits massacres. Hmm. Hammond Fizz, thank you so much for the 19 months. Hmm. This can't be true. Twitter users online told me that if you kill a paramilitary group's leader, the rest of them are like, oh, I guess we lost. And then they go home. That's what they told me. They told me that they're like, oh, we admit defeat. You killed our leader and then they go home. That's how that's how that works. And that there's definitely no way that they could appoint another leader. Right? We will win just as we won our confrontation with Israel in 2006, said the deputy chief as he ended the video message. Hmm. Al Jazeera Zaina uh, Kudr responding from or reporting from Beirut said that his message was intended to reassure Lebanon's Shia population who feel vulnerable after losing Nasrallah, having seen him as a father figure. He was trying to reassure his people that Hezbollah still has the military capabilities to fight telling Israel it's not ready to surrender. Hmm. But I thought Hezbollah was destroyed. Genuinely, like, can you imagine if the, if like the United States Pentagon was like nuked, like pick a country that has nuclear uh, power, okay? And they just drop a nuke on the Pentagon. Can you imagine someone tweeting out, you have to admit, that was pretty epic. <laughs> that was pretty epic. And it should be applauded. You think this guy would be, uh... I think this guy would be tweeting that if uh, the United States' Pentagon was nuked and, like, we lost tens of thousands of civilians in the process? Or do you think it's just because it's brown people? It, could, it can't be that one, right? It can't be that one. Hmm. Hmm. No. 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 Um, I kind of wanted to watch. I know that... Um, Al Jazeera put together this video a few months back about Hezbollah and it says, what is Hezbollah and how is it linked to the Israel-Gaza war? And I figure it's probably a good starting point for people who don't know um, anything about Hezbollah or how Lebanon got to the point that it is. So I thought we could watch it together if you guys are interested. Let's talk about Hezbollah. It's the Lebanese group that's back in the headlines. There's been an intense exchange of rocket fire across the Israel-Lebanon border. Hezbollah fires across the border every day. Israel is targeting what it says are Hezbollah cells. Some countries classify Hezbollah as a terror group, but it's also deeply embedded in Lebanese politics and society. More powerful than the state, and more armed than the Lebanese army itself. Hezbollah is a militant movement. It defines itself as a resistance and pushing back against U.S. and Israeli policies. It's also very close to Iran. They take orders from Iran. So how did Hezbollah come onto the scene? What exactly is its connection to Iran? And how powerful is the group today? The name Hezbollah means party of God. 
Now that might make it sound like it's a religious group, but it's actually a lot of things. It is a religious movement, and its members are mainly from the Shia branch of Islam. But not all Shia Muslims in Lebanon support Hezbollah. It's also a political party, with members in Lebanon's parliament and ministers in the cabinet. And it's an armed group. They say they've got 100,000 fighters, but it's hard to know for sure, and some experts suggest it's lower, likely between 20 and 50,000. This is a secretive organization, even within, you know, party members. Somebody working in a, whatever, a bank, a school, could be a Hezbollah fighter, and you don't know that. I mean, this is uh, one of the strengths of Hezbollah. Um, they tend not to show uh, all their cards, if you like. This is a group that does not have known military bases. Hassan Nasrallah is the Shia cleric who's led Hezbollah for more than 30 years. He's rarely seen in person. But in areas where support for Hezbollah is strong, like in the southern suburbs of the capital Beirut and in the south of Lebanon, his image is everywhere. And you also see posters of Iranian leaders because the group does not hide its links with Iran. I'm going to read the subtitles. All of Hezbollah's budget, expenses, wages, foods, uh, food, drinks, weapons, and rockets are all supplied by the Islamic Republic of Iran. Some experts even characterize Hezbollah as essentially part of Iran's armed forces, a branch called the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. They are part of Iran's regional military structure. They have Lebanese IDs, but their loyalty and their job and their mission is to serve the interests of the IRGC's Quds Force. Full stop. The Quds Force is the IRGC branch that's mostly focused on foreign operations. So how did Hezbollah come about? Well, there are three main factors that help explain its rise. The first is the Shia factor. Lebanon has always been very divided along religious and sectarian lines. Along with the Shia, the other main groups are Sunni Muslims and Christians. Lebanon's political system assigns them all key positions. It's designed so that they share power, but in practice, it tends to exacerbate divisions and the Shia have often felt that they get the worst deal and are neglected by the government in Beirut. Uh, the Shia community has long felt marginalized on the fringes of society. In the 1970s, a political and armed movement fighting for Shia rights had cropped up. Other groups were vying for power too, including the PLO, a Palestinian group that had established itself in southern Lebanon. By 1975, they all turned on each other and a civil war broke out. The Lebanese are fighting among themselves, Muslims against Christians and left against right. The war lasted until 1990, and it was in the chaos of all the fighting that Hezbollah emerged. And this brings us to our second factor, Iran and the 1979 revolution. Iran's monarchy was overthrown and replaced by an Islamic Republic, led by Shia cleric Mullah Khomeini. The revolution established Iran as the dominant Shia power in the region. Khomeini um, saw himself and saw the revolution as something that goes beyond Iran. He saw, he saw this as more of a pan-Islamic revolution that goes even beyond the Shia community. So Iran wanted to spread its ideology and influence, and everything going on in Lebanon provided an opportunity for that especially after 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon. And this is the third factor that explains Hezbollah's rise. Now, Israel said it was going after the PLO. Remember, that's the Palestinian group that was based in southern Lebanon, and it had been attacking Israel from there. Tanks roll into southern Lebanon. The Israelis said they had one goal, to root out once and for all Palestinian bases across the border from their northern settlements. Israeli forces reached all the way to Beirut. Later, they withdrew to southern Lebanon and occupied an area there right up until 2000. The Israelis, they didn't just like kick the Palestinians out and leave. They came, they stayed, they occupied. And here's where our three factors all converge in 1982. A group of Shia in Lebanon, who were already aligned with Iran's revolutionary ideology, had come together to fight the Israeli forces. Iran capitalized on that, providing training, funding, and weapons. 
And that group adopted a name, Hezbollah. Iran invested in an organic reality. You had Lebanese Shias who suffered decades of um, marginalization from the Lebanese state and also were suffering from Israeli occupation and were, were radicalized by the events of 1982. And hence comes a, um, a movement uh, to uh, build on all of that. From the beginning, Hezbollah mainly defined itself as a resistance force against the Israeli occupation. In 1985, they stated that the obliteration of Israel from existence was one of their ultimate aims. They also said they wanted to kick out U.S. and French troops who were in Lebanon as part of peacekeeping missions. Their tactics included assassinations, hostage taking, suicide attacks, and some high-profile bombings, like one on the U.S. Embassy in Beirut that killed 63 people. Then, in the early 1990s, there was a shift for Hezbollah. Lebanon's civil war had ended, and the group started to evolve from this shadowy militia into a major power broker. Hezbollah set up a political party. It won its first seats in parliament in 1992 and eventually became a leading voice for Lebanon's Shia community. In comes this party, this powerful and strong party, who tells them that, you know, we will protect you from the others. and We will ensure that you have a say in government, that you have a say in the decision-making process in this country. Since 2005, Hezbollah has had cabinet ministers running various government departments. It's also been described as a state within a state, providing all sorts of social services in the areas they control, things like health, education, and youth programs. They even give you know, these cards to, to some of their members to get groceries at a discount. But the main thing that sets Hezbollah apart from other Lebanese political factions is that it has weapons, a lot of them. At the end of the civil war, Hezbollah kept its weapons. It said it needed them to fight Israel. And it did keep fighting. First, they were focused on pushing Israel out of southern Lebanon and got a lot of credit when Israel finally withdrew in 2000. Since then, fighting has repeatedly flared up, including a war in 2006, which lasted 34 days. A big part of Hezbollah's appeal in Lebanon is based on this perception that it is the most effective force to stand up to Israel. But having such a strong armed group separate from the government is also seen as problematic. Its opponents in Lebanon believe that those arms are being used for Hezbollah to advance its political interests in the country. There are many who view it as a problematic uh, um, player on, on the Lebanese scene. I would say a good half of, of the country would see it as such. Another way of looking at it is that Hezbollah is both a cause and a symptom of even deeper problems in Lebanon a country with a broken, sectarian political system that allows corruption to thrive and has kept the economy in the gutter. 80% of people now live in poverty. Every time you try to deal with the corrupt political elite, you are always hit by Hezbollah's arms that it is protecting them. Take the uh, uh, Beirut port explosion. What the It was a dark day in Lebanon's history, August 4, 2020. Two years on, there's still been no accountability for one of the biggest non-nuclear blasts in history. Not one top official has been held to account. Hezbollah is also accused of standing in the way of the investigation into the explosion at the Beirut port. At one point, this even spilled over into deadly fighting on the streets of Beirut, when Hezbollah supporters protested against the lead judge investigating the explosion. But Hezbollah's activities and influence aren't just confined to Lebanon. It's the most powerful group in what's known as Iran's axis of resistance. This is a network of groups that Iran supports to spread its influence and interests in the region. It includes militias in Iraq and Syria, Hamas in Gaza, and the Houthis in Yemen. But they're all part of the Iranian regional structure, military structure. This is, this is how Iran works. Iran fights America and fights Israel via proxies and partners. This helps to explain why Hezbollah took part in the Syrian war, for example. 
Syria's president, Bashar al-Assad, is an ally of Iran, and Hezbollah fought as part of an Iranian alliance to keep him in power. That move alienated some of Hezbollah's supporters who felt it wasn't the group's job to get involved. But the war also gave Hezbollah a reason to recruit, and its fighters got combat experience. Uh, Hezbollah has also grown its special forces capabilities, given its role in the conflict in Syria. So today, you're looking at a group that's really strong militarily. It has a lot of weapons, a grip on Lebanon, and Iran behind it. Right now it's in the spotlight because of the war in Gaza which has reignited the fight between Hezbollah and Israel. Hezbollah has fired rockets into Israel, killing soldiers and civilians. It says it won't stop until Israel ends its war on Gaza. And Israel's hit back, firing into Lebanon, killing civilians along with Hezbollah fighters and at least two senior commanders. Tens of thousands of people living on either side of the border have had to leave their homes. Many people are questioning whether this could all turn into a full-blown war and a wider regional conflict. It's always a possibility. But at the same time, Israel and Hezbollah both know that the other one has the capacity to do huge damage, and that might be encouraging them to hold back. So both sides are still treading carefully. Hezbollah does not want a full-blown war, and it can hurt Israel. It can hit anywhere in Israel. It can fire thousands of rockets a day, but Israel too can hurt Hezbollah. If you're interested in news and... I think that's a pretty good video. Hezbollah hit 95% military targets other than Israel. This isn't... This is Israel treading carefully? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I imagine this will surely de-escalate since you know Hezbollah has no leader now and surely they will not select a new leader definitely that will not happen great video am I crazy or this is a better news outlet than most of what we have in the west I mean when it comes to covering like wormy when it comes to covering Middle Eastern um, news Al Jazeera is probably like the best de-escalation through escalation yeah peace through war of course mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely um i wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about something maybe all of us can enjoy something a bit more lighthearted. oh wait before we do that before we do that for half a second before we do that for half a second. Did you guys see this tweet? If you do not identify Israel as Israeli or Jewish, could you explain your reasons for supporting Israel? I looked at 1948 critically and came to the conclusion that the British overcompromised the land to two people. Six Arab states started a war to forcefully take it all. And the Jews miraculously won. Now Israel has spent 76 years dealing with egos that cannot escape that when you start wars, there are consequences, including lost land, dead civilian and closed borders. How did I know without even looking that this was a Brianna Wu tweet? Uh, uh, uh. Where do you stand on the displacement and dispossession of the 770,000 Palestinians that were never allowed to return to their homes? It was probably unwise for them to have tried to slaughter their neighbors in, res in retrospect... The Arab descendants of the ones that did that are not Israeli citizens today. I just have no words, man. I have no words. I just don't. I don't. <laughs> 